Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and welcome to this webinar, which is the first that we've staged. By we, I'm talking about a project on uh, populism and constitutional democracy, which is funded by the Australian Research Council, and also the University of New South Wales uh, Network for Interdisciplinary Studies of Law. Our subject, as you know, is a sparkling, strong, embracing book, The New Despotism by John Keane, uh, in the other tie on your screen, who is Professor of Politics at University of Sydney. The book is important, the subject's important, the timing is important, and so too is the author. John is a remarkable and remarkably prolific author of astonishing range of writings on subjects too many for me to rehearse here, though you can look at them on our invitation and on John's Website, and they deal with many subjects, but a central concern of his, and as far as I can tell, has been uh, for a very, very long time, is power in its multifarious forms, its locations, and its pathologies. He has a deep antipathy, which I share, to arbitrary power, and a concomitant obsession with how power might be tempered, tamed, and harnessed to good uses. He has famously investigated civil society, violence, democracy, the media, and the character of power itself. He has a particular interest in, and an affection for, power sharing, or what he calls monetary democracy, the conditions of its effectiveness, its often false simulacra, and the threats that it faces from many sources, both familiar and novel. He's talented as a portrayer of the most important political problems and trends of our time, a perceptive and penetrating analyst of them, and he's also a powerful political voice in relation to them. And he seems to know everything. When I read this book, I emailed him and, uh, to ask whether he had hacked into the vacuum cleaner at The Economist magazine and hoovered up all that they know. He didn't answer, so I still don't know, but his range is daunting. These concerns, his concerns, large and sometimes desperate concerns, pervade this extremely rich and engaging, nerve-wracking book, which has been published recently by Harvard University Press at a remarkable moment, one in which the novel developments John examined are joined by an equally remarkable development, of course, the pandemic. Everything he talks about and says in the book is challenging and has now in very order, been joined, very short order, been joined by the challenges we're all facing from the pandemic. So in the new Descartian spirit that I'm told philosophers now dub covid ego zoom we're pleased to join you and we're also pleased that so many of you have joined us tonight. Others will be able to watch this, watch the recording and you can keep watching it for the rest of your lives because it'll be posted on our project's website. The our site is indicated on Carolyn Evans' uh, uh, slide. And I stress that the uh, webinar is being recorded. So if you would rather not yourself be recorded, then keep your button muted. The order of events is as follows. John will introduce the book for around 25 minutes. And then the three chief investigators in our project, the populism project, will each comment for 10 minutes. Those commentators whom you can see on the screen are Wojciech Sadurski uh, on the upper right, at least on my screen, with glasses and headphones, uh, who is Chalice Professor of Jurisprudence at Sydney University, is often found before one or other Polish court, but luckily for us and for him at the moment, he's in Sydney. The next uh, participant is Adam Chalnota, Associate Professor at University of New South Wales in Sydney, but at present at in Kenshin in, in Poland, and the third is me, uh, and I am in Sydney, and I'm at the University of New South Wales. Please speak for a rigorously policed maximum of 10 minutes. After eight minutes, I'll put up this gesture, which is not a vulgar gesture intended for anyone else, though it might become that, but is simply to indicate two more minutes to go. You might notice that the onomatopoeic acronym for the commentating team, Wojciech, Adam, and me, is WAM. And after WAM delivers their blow, uh, John will valiantly, but briefly, no doubt, 
respond. And then the floor or the ether will be open for Q and A. We're delighted, truly delighted, that so many of you from all over the world have turned up for this event, but that means we haven't been able to fit you on the screen and that we've had to formalize the Q&A somewhat and the rules of engagement are these. Those who wish to ask a question should use the chat function either to type your question or to write that you would like to speak. Dr. Carolyn Evans, our omnicompetent, omniscient, uh, and omnipotent project coordinator and pu puppet mistress of this whole show uh, behind the screen with the light bulb will coordinate the questions and see that those who we can fit in the time get a chance to ask them and answer them. If you have any technical difficulties, send a private chat to Carolyn or email her at her email address, uh, carolyn at thinkevans.com.au. And now I ask John to introduce us to his book. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. I wanted to say uh, the sun has just set here in Sydney and I wanted therefore to say good evening and jin dobre, uh, good morning, uh, wherever you are and thank you all for, for coming along. I wanted to also thank uh, Carolyn. Um, Martin has already used superlatives, uh, herding cats. Um, uh, might be another way of uh, putting her technical and administrative skills. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. Um, I also want to thank the WAM group at this point. Um, Martin, um, a very good friend. Uh, my main mentor here in Australia has taught me in matters of arbitrary power many things. Adam um, from uh, the University of New South Wales, I'm uh, delighted that you're here, and Wojciech Sadurski. Uh, whose um, recent book on Poland's constitutional breakdown, I have just finished reading, I think is terrific. I also want to thank Wojciech for um, periodically including me in his uh, Twitter messages. Uh, and thanks to him, I get called uh, from Poland a liar, um, a lover of the European Union, uh, and quite recently a German apologist and spy, which I think is a reference to my um, um, chair at the Wissenschaft Central Berlin. So thank you very much, uh, Wojciech, for, for uh, those Greek gifts, so to say. Um, this little green book is, um, of course, like every book, uh, it is uh, one marked by personal experiences. Uh, for me, uh, probably this book is born uh, about a decade ago during the opening trial of um, where the deputy straight, the state prosecutor of the Republic of Iran accused me and Dick Rorty and Jürgen Habermas as the three masterminds of the Velvet Counter-Revolution after the disputed uh, 2009 elections. There are some obviously overlaps with uh, what is uh, today going on in Belarus and it was during that trial that I was accused of being an MI5, MI6 uh, and CIA agent. I still haven't received um, uh, any honoraria from those organizations, but it was during a trial where several hundred intellectuals, journalists, NGO activists were uh, sent uh, down uh, and have suffered uh, terribly since. Uh, it was for me a moment uh, of, uh, of great shock and um, it flung me into a certain wonderment about um, Iran type uh, regimes. This book, of course, like every other book, uh, is born of a time and place. It appears uh, in a period we are all aware of uh, that resembles somehow a Shakespearean moment, a moment uh, when um, there are many surprises, there is great disorder, there are many things that do not make sense, and there are things happening that seem to be uh, too difficult, too complex uh, to think. One thing is clear that there is writing on uh, democracy's wall. This book appears in that context, uh, a, a broader context that stretches back to the collapse of the Soviet Union, European stagnation, disorder in the Arab world, 
um, a beleaguer beleaguered and belligerent Russia, a self-confident China, which uh, in the book I describe as the leader of the pack of the new despotisms, uh, in a context where the United States, supposedly the most powerful um, imperial democracy on the face of the earth, is looking more like a failed state or a failing state. And this book um, was launched in the midst of the pestilence, uh, a pestilence that might well turn out to be as significant as, for example, uh, the events of 1989 to 1991, uh, a period in which um, I think here Ivan Krastev has correctly pointed out that in 1989-91, uh, intellectuals had a strong sense of, of, of what should be done, of what should replace uh, that Soviet model. Uh, he points out, I think rightly, that we're living in times in which it's much less clear uh, what are the intellectual normative coordinates of this period. This book is a small contribution to trying to clarify that, uh, uh, that very point. Um, there is a second um, uh, point that I, there are six altogether that I want uh, to, to just lay on the table in the next 20 minutes or so. The second point is that when you look at this book, I hope you will see that this is a book about language uh, in matters of power and politics, needless to say, um, language counts and language frames concepts. This book um, is in a way what the Germans would call a retende critique. It's an attempt to retrieve uh, an unfashionable word, despotism, to bring it, so to say, like a, a pearl to the surface, to um, polish it, to actually reconstruct it, to um, mobilize it, to try to make sense of uh, one major trend of our time, or so the argument is. This um, book is, you will see, uh, a call to break old taxonomies of, um, of politics, taxonomies of regime types, for instance. And so through the course of the book, um, I have quarrels with uh, some key terms that are in circulation at present. There is, I think, something like in this period, a phrase struggle going on globally, you know, uh, an attempt to find um, words that actually have uh, wider public significance that describe things well and that have normative and strategic uh, consequences. And so this book um, is not pleased with um, the, the popularity of the word autocracy. That's a word that guides uh, Masha Gessen's um, uh, a recent book on uh, Putinism, for instance. Um, the regimes I'm going to describe are not aut aut autocracies. Actually, for instance, they are riddled with connections, with, with clientelism, with, with patronage. What the Chinese call guangxi. Um, in Arabic, it's wasta. Uh, it's blood in, in Russian. Uh, connections bind together the system, um, and that applies also to the very top. These are not tyrannies, if by uh, tyranny is meant systems, political systems, where fear and chaos uh, rule, where the tyrant trap uh, operates. Um, these are not old-fashioned military dictatorships of um, Mugabe Zimbabwe uh, type, for instance. I do not think that these despotisms can be described, um, this is Karen Dawisha's uh, attempt, uh, as kleptocracies. Uh, John McCain uh, had a version of this, Senator John McCain, uh, when describing Putin's Russia, uh, merely a gas station masquerading as a state, said he. I think that is a fundamental misdescription of the complexity of these regimes and in the way in which actually they uh, distribute patronage. Uh, state expenditure is very important uh, for binding the polities together. Um, they are not simply uh, robber uh, states. These are not fascist regimes. They are not totalitarian. They are not systems in uh, which uh, total fear prevails, where there is constant mass mobilization and where, let's say, a well-articulated single ideology structures uh, what um, the polities uh, uh, do. 
I do not think, Slavoj Žižek, these are simply crude forms of state capitalism. I don't think they are hybrid regimes. I think that um, a phrase is a nonsense a phrase. It has a definite popularity of our time, but it's, I think, not meaningful. And I don't think, for reasons that I'm very happy to speak about, I do not think that authoritarianism is, a, is, is um, the right word to capture the dynamics of what I'm about to describe. That dog-tired word um, uh, is more problematic than uh, most um, users of, of, of it suppose. And I um, want in particular uh, to say in this book that one of the problems with that concept, there are three or four, is that it, it, it has connotations of rule ultimately through the fist, through force. Whereas these despotisms, I want to say, and say at some length in the book, are systems that pay attention to uh, the problem of uh, winning the loyalty of the subject population, that voluntary servitude is one of their characteristics. Third point, the book makes a case, particularly towards uh, the end uh, section, uh, for the advantages of resurrecting, reconstructing, and uh, mobilizing this old term despotism. Um, one reviewer, Colin Woodward, uh, in the Washington Monthly said that the only thing going for this concept uh, is that it has a kind of shock effect. Uh, I think that's a misunderstanding of, of why it is that, um, that I want to uh, revive this term. I think this term, this old term that went out of fashion um, roughly in the middle of last uh, century, a term that has an extraordinary history and uh, often a tainted history. It probably is a Sumerian word. It was used in the Greek, classical Greek context to describe the despotus, uh, the head of a household, the man who is in charge of, of his wife, uh, children and slaves. It um, underwent a Christianization. It was used for several centuries as uh, an Orientalist term of abuse of the East. It is in the East that despotic power prevails, unlike uh, uh, Europe, where respect for rule of law, for freedom, for liberty, uh, uh, by contrast, prevails. It is a term, I think, that as with every term in the analysis of the political, it has three uh, usages, entangled usages to be sure, Descriptively speaking, um, this concept of despotism gets at the point that these are polities uh, whose rulers try to exercise a certain charm, a certain seductiveness. They are not describable as regimes that rule through the fist, that are repressive, that deny. Uh, this is the whole point of um, the connection between despotism and voluntary servitude, which um, comes to be, it's right from the beginning, think of the despotis. Uh, the head of the household is someone who is uh, meant to um, uh, bear in mind the welfare of uh, those whom he rules. Normatively speaking, this concept of despotism, I think has advantages. It seems to me more ecumenical, than that of authoritarianism, for example, it refers to the problem of arbitrary power. The term um, refuses the legitimacy of arbitrary power. It is in this sense, normatively speaking, a foghorn concept, as I put it. And I draw upon particularly the second half of the 18th century, um, Diderot, uh, is, is one of the, the, the key characters who uses the term repeatedly uh, to refer, as he put it, to the danger of seduction by arbitrary power. And the counterfactual is power sharing, the restraint of power, accountability of power. It seems to me it has potentially a strongly universal thrust uh, to it. That is, that the concept of despotism contains this normative implication. And strategically, I think that um, uh, in the book you will see that one of the 
surprising theses is that an advantage of the category of despotism is that it was from the 18th century always uh, aligned on uh, the same spectrum as democracy. Uh, these were not um, polar opposites. They were not um, binary uh, uh, in their differences. Um, there was those who used the category of despotism warned um, that um, government in the name of the people could morph. It could undergo um, a metamorphosis into despotism. And you will see in the book that the strategic problem of how um, these despotisms, this new form of power can be counted, weakened, politically defeated, is uh, central. Fourth point, um, I want to say a few words as briefly as I can about um, what this form of power that I'm calling despotism um, looks like. Of course, the term is an ideal type, but striking. Um, and several reviewers have um, pointed this out, including uh, Gagana Dimova, who is a Bulgarian uh, political uh, thinker based uh, in London, um, that a key quality of these despotisms, Saudi, Turkey, Russia, China, Uzbekistan, Hungary, Vietnam, Singapore, a key quality of these despotisms um, is their recombinant character. That is, they are regimes that mix together different organizing principles, different institutional dynamics, mix them. So um, here, very, very briefly, is um, a list of the kinds of uh, dynamics that the book tries to detail. All of them are uh, regimes in which good governance, uh, being whip smart, uh, institutionalized, institutionalizing learning mechanisms um, is a very important uh, quality. Uh, Chinese intellectuals uh, refer to liang hao de ji yi, good governance, and by that they mean that those who rule should uh, draw upon public opinion polling uh, mechanisms, think tanks. They should do Facebook, Instagram, uh, WeChat. They um, uh, vary, of course, from context to context. Uh, in Singapore, probably the masters of these learning mechanisms. The REACH program since the 1980s um, has uh, been all important. Uh, in the Emirates, you may not know, but there, is, there are happiness forums you know, embedded within the regime to, to try to divine opinions about why uh, people are happy or unhappy. Um, in Vietnam, persistent threat units. In Southern China, uh, public hearings um, online, public hearings. I mean, all of these are mechanisms that are uh, one of the uh, central features of these despotisms. They are also defined, I'll kangaroo hop through these points uh, quickly. Um, this is still the fourth point. All of them are defined by a strong emphasis on the people, lots of talk of the people. They are phantom democracies as I describe them. The rulers are skittish. They are nervous about um, their loss of power. And for that reason, they play the role as servants of the people. All of them are regimes in which clientelism uh, is a central a guiding principle. Uh, this means systems of vassalage. If you want to get a driver's license, if you want to get your passport renewed quickly, uh, if you want to do a business deal and get it sanctioned uh, by law, then connections are all important. Um, one of the wonderful um, illustrations of this um, importance of uh, vassalage, uh, of compromat, um, is Mohammad Rasulov's uh, Man of Integrity, uh, a remarkable film done by an Iranian filmmaker. And his point is that, of course, connections from top to bottom of the system are critical. So too is corruption. 
All of these uh, regimes have a middle class that tends to be quiet and to be loyal to those who rule. They do a lot of belly aching, but they also are encouraged to spend uh, and concentrate their time on their households, on careers, and to go shopping. Under Edoyan, uh, the number of shopping malls has increased eight times during his period of rule. All of them, paradoxically, are plutocracies. In China, the figures are still that roughly two new billionaires are minted per week with a tremendous gap between rich and poor. All of them are systems in which polygarchs uh, rule at the top. This, as I understand it, is a Hungarian uh, neologism to describe the way that those in business are entangled with state structures and those in state structures are entangled with business. Polygarchy uh, is a defining uh, a principle. All of them uh, have tame courts, uh, independent uh, courts with teeth are absent. There is rule through law. There is a kind of phantom rule of law, a rule through law. Jimmy Lai has recently discovered uh, that. In the book I describe in some detail the trial of Bo Xi Lai uh, in China, the main opponent of Xi Jinping who was uh, committed uh, to prison. The trial itself is, is a work of art. Uh, it is uh, an illustration of this rule uh, through law. All of them are media saturated uh, regimes. Fake news, um, PR, blackening reputations, the spreading of lies, of bullshit uh, is chronic. I describe these as regimes in which there is a kind of vaudeville government. Um, and here, I hope we can discuss it. Um, I want to say that um, ideology is not a defining quality of these despotisms. Um, it's rather that they rule uh, with, so to say, a coat of many colors. There's a polysemic uh, quality to uh, power. Um, Xi Jinping can, in one day, be the presenter and defender of ancient Chinese civilization, in the next breath speak about market-driven growth, in the next uh, breath speak about uh, the importance of democracy, and an hour later can give a speech uh, on uh, ecological civilization that could have been written by Greenpeace. It doesn't, uh, it, it's, a, it's a melange of, 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 uh, of words, but that has uh, definite functional advantages. And um, I want to say as well that um, two last characteristics to give you a sense of this recombinant quality of these regimes, all of them um, are regimes where there are welfare schemes. They're not gangster states, they're not kleptocracies to repeat. It's estimated that 50% of the Russian population, um, their daily lives are, are dependent primarily on state expenditure. In China, two thirds of GDP is sluiced uh, through uh, state structures. And there are experiments, uh, for example, in Singapore, where there are periodic payments from uh, a general sales tax that are given uh, as uh, a gift, so to say, to um, the population. And finally, all of these regimes, of course, are in a way police states, but the coercion is calibrated. Um, there is awareness at the top of what Eugene Ionesco once famously called rhinoceritis. They're aware of the dangers of fighting, of violence breaking out at the top, but they also, down below, uh, they uh, practice violence uh, in a selected, targeted way. Violence is stocking masks. And um, of course, sometimes it is exposed. Jamal Ka uh, Khashoggi, uh, the Uyghurs, Oleg Novoselsky, for example. Uh, but uh, the point is that the rulers use, it's a Chinese proverb, um, they kill chickens to scare the monkeys. Uh, fifth, almost finished, uh, Martin, uh, my chair with a guillotine. I uh, hope that when you look at this book, you will be struck when reading it that the book is a confrontation with the cliche, I would say the dogma, that democracies are 
in these years of the 21st century are fundamentally different than those, uh, than the logics, so to say, of despotism. Uh, to put it plainly, um, this book is an account of the way despotic power is alive and well within actually existing democracies. It does not think in terms of um, good versus uh, evil, good guys versus uh, bad guys. Um, and so if one looks at um, so-named democracies of our period, think of the similarities, think of the, the parallels, much talk of the people, um, elections that are in some contexts, of course, in the United States, poisoned by dark money. Democracies have been experiencing the growth of plutocracy for four decades now. Media gaslighting, lies, bullshit are circulated. We used to call it post-truth a couple of years ago. Um, there are pockets, zones of arbitrary power. That's true in large corporations like Amazon. Uh, it's also uh, 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 true, I think, um, in areas of power like the small arms trade or uh, areas of, um, of tax avoidance, for instance. You know, zones of power that are not publicly scrutinized, that are not subject to um, restraints. Arbitrary power in this sense um, is to be found and is threatening of democracy. All of um, these trends, I think, have been consolidated, I would say reinforced, by the great pestilence. Um, we have in the state of Victoria in Australia, something resembling a Wuhan style lockdown. I mean, it's not called that, but in form and content, it's very uh, similar. Uh, and I think that the um, reemergence of a new populism has exacerbated um, these uh, kinds of trends. The wrecking of accountability mechanisms, uh, a metaphor, uh, for uh, this uh, trend, I think, is the saga of the U.S. Postal Service, uh, which is currently at the center of um, an American uh, public uh, discussion. A body that is uh, said to be the most um, loved by Americans. It commands a very high popularity uh, rate. Um, number 45, as I call him, that's my way of being optimistic. There might be a 46th appoints um, a big donor to the Republican Party, uh, Louis de Joy, as the postmaster general, who then institutes um, budget cuts in order to um, slow down the postal service in a period where postal balloting is, of course, going to play a very central role and in which uh, a democracy in which 34 states uh, have a strict rule that if the ballots are not received by election day, they will not count. Therefore, millions of Americans likely will, uh, as things stand, um, have their votes uh, discounted. Finally, this book uh, raises uh, questions about the weaknesses, the structural weaknesses of these despotisms and of how strategically to deal with them. We're aware, I think, I think it's the least satisfactory part of the book. I'm expecting um, trouble uh, from, uh, the, um, uh, uh, from the wham uh, commentators, but I do uh, try to cover some ground by saying, for instance, uh, that picking a fight, trying to generate some 21st century version of a new Cold War um, is unlikely to work in part because of the resilience of these despotisms led by China. And it is even possible, here's a thought um, for this evening, it's even possible that democracies, Western democracies, would lose that Cold War, unlike the last time. I discuss um, the dangers of military confrontation, um, the possible, or I would say probable weakness of tariffs and trade uh, embargoes, partly because these despotisms hunt in packs. Uh, the book makes a plea uh, for understanding these polities, that that is a very important first step 
for the generation of any political strategy, any uh, policies, uh, government or civil society policies towards uh, these uh, regimes. Um, of course, um, the struggle for elections with integrity uh, uh, remains critically important. But the key argument of the book at the end, and on this point I end, is that it seems to me the most um, efficacious, um, the most compelling, um, the most, um, uh, uh, the, the, the reforms that are of central importance for dealing with this spread of arbitrary power in the form of despotism is cleaning up the Augean stables of actually existing democracies. If you're unfamiliar with um, Augean stables, King Augeas had uh, um, a herd of several thousand oxen uh, didn't clean his stables for over 30 years. Uh, there was quite a lot of uh, excrement that accumulated. It took a Hercules to redirect a river to clean those. What I mean is that um, uh, that democratic renewal, uh, strengthening the hand of, a, of accountability mechanisms, these, it seems to me, are of, of great strategic importance for dealing with these new despotisms and the despotism inside democracies. And one final thought about the weaknesses of these regimes. I say um, almost in the last, I think, two pages that um, surprise, the unexpected, may turn out to be um, the Achilles heel of these despotisms. It's the insufficiency of um, monitoring mechanisms inside these despotisms, the absence of a civil society, the absence of independent courts, the absence of um, a free journalism scene. It's that that makes them especially vulnerable, I think, uh, to um, earthquakes, to, I mean, uh, actually and, uh, uh, and, and symbolically. Um, surprises, uh, the unexpected, uh, can greatly embarrass and greatly disrupt these regimes. Behind this is the thought that democracy continues to be in the sense of power sharing and, and, and the uh, uh, accountability of power continues to be the great advantage of the ideals of democracy. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, John. And now the web begins uh, with Wojciech. Please. Bojic. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, never, I never knew that we are WAM. I never thought about this acronym. Uh, I think what acronym would serve if we put together our surnames like KSC, Kentucky Sizzle Chicken, something like that. Anyway, thank you very much, John, for uh, being the hero of our uh, of our web webinar today, thank you for your introduction, and most importantly, thank you for your absolutely splendid book. Uh, the book is very very beautiful, uh, also in a in an aesthetic sense, uh, which for the gloomy uh, nature of maybe ninety percent of it, and it's really gloom and doom. Just to pick up your recent uh, method mythological. Uh, analogy which you just threw about um, um, uh, Augios uh, stables, I would say that the book is almost like Augius meets Sisyphus, you know, to, to, uh, to carry on the methodolo methodological analogy. Uh, but uh, for, for that topic, it's truly a beautiful book, remarkably uh, captivating in style. It's, it's a great read, and I would like even for this reason, although obviously it's not the main reason to recommend it to everyone, it's a terrific read. Here is one of my favorite sentences. Uh, John has already referred to his concept of the vaudeville state. And at a certain point, he says, the big despotism tent show is a new type of vaudeville government, let's call it. The rulers parade their mag magicians, drummers, and dancers. And really the book is encrusted with this type of wonderful, wonderful uh, statements and formula. Uh, but obviously the most important thing is about its substance. So before I move to my maybe uh, 
critical, uh, critical comments, let me precede them by a very general statement uh, and evaluation and a general praise for the book that I by and large uh, find your uh, description, your account of despotisms compelling. This combination of state regulated capitalism, top down patronage, middle class loyalty, uh, staged elections, all that with a very sort of, with a description which is very sensitive to social psychology or to, you know, sociology of everyday life. This is, this really, I have absolutely no qualms with that, with that description. However, my, 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 per, my, my role here is not only to praise, but also to offer critical comments. And I will offer three such criticisms, mainly for the sake of our discussion in an increasing uh, order of generality. So first of all, uh, I would like to say something about your rejection of characterizations of these systems as hybrid and transitional at the same time. And this rejection is encapsulated by your sentence at page 19. More than a few observers postponed the task of careful categorization by labeling them hybrid regimes. This fuzzy phrase means little. It supposes that they are somehow stuck in transition between democracy and non-democracy. Now it seems to me uh, that this type of lumping together the transitionalism and hybridity uh, is unhelpful. I, for one, also full, am now fully convinced to what some people, Thomas Carothers, I think, called the end of the transition paradigm. This idea which so many of us, students of post-communist politics, thought that we now are in this transitional uh, stage so that there is a certain trajectory where the end point, end point is relatively determined, good, and relatively near, just around the corner, that this all turned out, unfortunately, to be nonsense. But I do not think that uh, we need, if we dispense with this uh, characterization of, uh, of those regimes which you describe as despotic, is transitional. I do not think that we need also to dispense with uh, the description of them as hybrid. In fact, if I look at them, even only through your own uh, description, uh, they are anything but hybrid. After all, you know, they carry uh, the characteristics which in their ideal forms belong to regimes which are mutually incompatible. And yet, uh, you know, they are at the same time well, despotic in the sense tyrannical, although you reject the concept of tyranny, but they are oppressive, they are centralized, they are one person's rule, but they also have a number of uh, characteristics of democracy, maybe not perfect democracy, maybe not power sharing democracy, but yourself, even in your presentation today, but also in your book, you talk about consultations, which sort of reminds me of John Rawls's idea of those decent but illiberal societies. That is, the, okay, so they, they don't have power sharing uh, democracy, but they care about what people think, they want to talk to people, and when the matter is not particularly politically sensitive, they will listen to it. So, you know, I think that hybrid character of these societies is, so to speak, on its face. That's the first point. The second point is slightly more general, and that has to do with all your uh, sort of battle, theoretical battles within the industry, within the political science of democratization or democratic deconsolidation, uh, where you sort of, I think, absolutely fairly trademark the concept of new despotism. And I think it's a useful and, and great concept, and you make a compelling positive case for it. I find your negative cases against other alternative or competing, well, not necessarily competing, other descriptors, much less compelling. So that I think that all these uh, type of characterizations which we have on the table, uh, which are sort of like Freedom House type of characterizations of those different sort of systems which are neither fully power sharing democracy nor absolute oppression North Korean style, you know, each of them can bring some important 
truth uh, to, the, uh, to the picture because each of them sort of focus on something else, something else which is real, which is there. Uh, so that has to do with delegative democracy, which you reject, which I find rather useful because it emphasizes that this, demo this is a democratic system at the moment of election, but not between the elections and without accountability. Uh, you reject the idea of liberal democracy, but most importantly, I just wonder about this sort of almost conceptual imperialism, if I may call it so, uh, the, this great zeal with which you reject the concept of authoritarianism. Frankly, I don't know why. I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't get your point. I take it that you make two main points against authoritarianism. One, uh, and now you said that there are three or more, but I, I picked up two main uh, in your book around pages 212 to 213. One is that it presupposes a false distinction between authoritarianism and democracy. Well, there is, they are more on a spectrum rather than binary concept. But if that's the case, then I suppose that goes back to this idea of hybridity. I think you make the point that there are some aspects of, if you like, decency or even rights observance, for example, right to emigrate, which all these systems love because they get rid of dissidents and of the of troublemakers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they are, you know, truly authoritarian in the sense of centralized one person's power. And the second argument I take it is that the very concept of authoritarianism presupposes that there is uh, a fundamental Uh-oh. The mental distinction between, I, I'm looking at Martin, who uh, I think I have unstable connection. Anyway, so that, so I won't, be, I won't be carrying on because my time is up. So let me just make- No, it's not. You've got another minute. Ah, okay. So, so I would very much uh, be in favor of quality qualified authoritarianism's descriptions, such as, I don't know, Ramseman's pragmatic authoritarianism, which you referred to, or competitive authoritarianism of, of, of Levitsky, or populist democracy, all these, all these adjectives qualify in a <coughs> way the, the noun and take away much, I think, of its uh, severity or strength. Let me just sketch my third point for which I will have no time to describe uh, or to develop, so I, I will merely highlight it. And that is, uh, and that's the most general one. So in the political science, there is a distinction between supply side, supply side and demand side of politics. And uh, I think that your book very much locates itself on the supply, on emphasis on the supply side of what do leadership, what does leadership provide that makes people happy? What do they deliver? What sort of benefits they deliver? Individual wealth, public dignity and, and pride, etc. That's one important aspect. And I myself, in the book, which you have very generously mentioned at the beginning, uh, I, have, I have also emphasized the supply side in explaining the rise of Kaczynski in Poland or Orban in Hungary. But I think that we shouldn't be totally myopic to this more traditional approach to our understanding uh, the democratic backsliding or deconsolidation and look at the demand side, at these uh, larger structural causes. And interestingly, this, this book is quite silent on it. So I, it's not a criticism, rather a question. Was it a deliberate choice that you decided to focus on what do leaders give to the citizens to maintain their loyalty, conformism and support? rather than on the long-term structural, largely economic causes, which lead to the relative success of, of despotism. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Wojtek. Uh, now, once I get my stopwatch working, which I've done, I ask Adam, who comes from the, from the center, well, near the center of what I, but maybe not he, would call a new despotism in waiting. Uh, Adam. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, John, for the book and the introduction. <clears throat> well, the, first of all, I would like to apologize that I don't wear a tie 
Tunis told me that oh, without Thai, I don't have any authority to speak. Unfortunately, I am, you know, in my hometown when I was born, it's in the northeast of, of Poland, and uh, I don't have a Thai with me. So sorry for that. Uh, you have to do without, without Thai. And then uh, when I mentioned my hometown, Kenshin, which is in Germany, you know, in Germany it was called Rastenburg. It is, is connected with power in such a way that five kilometers away, there was a Wolf, uh, <coughs> Hitler's war, war portrait. It doesn't make me any expert on power. Therefore, all my all my uh, <clears throat> points, which I try to 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 uh, to make in relation to your book, are yeah, basically very uh, general. So I've got the first of all places, then the, then these four points which I wanted to, to 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 mention, and then in the end, few questions. So the first of all is John in the introduction started in a very humble way telling a little green book. That's not a Gaddafi book, of course, and uh, and it's not a little book. It's a, it's a very sophisticated and and uh, full of issues book. Then in is what it seems to me when I started to read this book, then I thought after the finishing reading that there are two different types of scholars. It means that first type of scholars are scholars who follow the well-established roads. And then the second type of scholars are the scholars who simply uh, focus on the uncharted territories. And then I discovered after reading that John represents the third type of scholars. It means, what does it mean? It means he's interested in the new phenomena. It means uncharted territories, but at the same time, with due respect to the tradition. It means tradition in the, in the history of, of, of political uh, philosophy. So that, uh, <clears throat> Everybody who will read this book, and it was mentioned already by, by Wojciech, will be overwhelmed by the enormous erudition of the author. And it's, I, it's not only plenty of different languages, which, uh, but also the citation and the use of, the, of the, some forgotten authors from the 17th century and uh, up to the, to the 21st century. And uh, the third point, it seems to me, in relation of my praise to the book is that uh, that enormous empirical material we gathered there. It means uh, Wojciech mentioned that from the plenty of different fields, but uh, they are not put separately, but somehow you manage to, to combine them. It means to present to the reader some sort of the uh, convincing interpretation of, this, of that uh, empirical material. And then let's go to the critical part, it means, for the sake of discussion. I have to mention that I've been lucky, I've got, I've got the privilege that for the last one and a half months, I participate in the reading group through the Zoom, uh, organized by CLEST. CLEST is a, is a <clears throat> stands for the Center for Legal Education and Social Theory, when the younger colleagues from Romania, Poland, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Italy, we discuss your book. So I not only read this book, but also uh, went through in the, some, uh, in the big details. So, so some of my questions, they were questions which arise during the re reading group of devoted to, to your book. As John mentioned, it means in the introduction, the aim of the book is a resurrection, basically, of the, of the notion of despotism. I understand that the resurrection of the notion of despotism, the aim is to, to create a category which will allow us to interpret the reality, right? It means this is a concept which is an analytical tool to understand what's going on in the, in the political world. And then, you know, so what is here, it seems to me, is a choice of uh, case studies mentioned. And I, one of the problems which we've got in the discussion was the criteria for choice of these case studies. It means China, Vietnam, Kyrgyzia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Hungary, Belarus. So the question, it's a question which arises, why, for instance, not Poland, but Hungary, for instance, and, uh, and uh, why the Central Asian countries and not, let's say, Latin American countries in, in who, when also it's possible to find out some traces, at least, of the new despotism. And now what I wanted to do is to, to go to the four points only. It means four points which, are, it seems to me, uh, 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 will allow me to fully understand uh, your, your book. The first of all is a 
is something which is missing, it seems to me, from the book. It means that what is the hidden normative model of a political regime you adopt for, for when you criticize, uh, describe, let's say, the manifestation of the despotism. So the starting point somewhere there, but you, you didn't ex, you know, explicitly put in the, in, the, in the book what is this starting normative model. Is that so deeply hidden, and especially if we take into account the enormous empirical material, that it's very difficult to reconstruct such a model. At well, the very beginning, when you mentioned Machiavelli and so on, then I thought, well, there's a sort of the Republican. But later on, I was lost, actually. So that, that this, uh, uh, this normative model, it seems to me, should be more explained, especially that you mildly criticize liberal democracy, which is quite, let's say, close to my heart, but mild, uh, mild cr critique of liberal de democracy. But uh, then, I, as, I, as I said before, it, it seems to me that, that it's very difficult to, to find out this model. And then you stress the efficiency of the new despotism, which is supported somehow by citizens. So the question which we, we, we discuss in the, in the reading group was uh, connect, is it, <clears throat> with this uh, hidden dimension, hidden normative dimension, it's how we can criticize the choice of citizens upon what sort of criteria, basically. But those criteria were not uh, spelled out in the, in the book. And this, so after this hidden normative model, the second point which I want to, to take up is an is a absence of social theory. It means I try to look at your book from the traditional point of view. It means in the chapter entitled Why New Despotism, when you trace the etymology of the concept of, of uh, despotism, and uh, starting from the 17th century up to the 19th century, finishing basically, with, it seems to me, with Stockwell as such, right? Then, then and then when you, dis when you discuss the enlightenment despotism as, as, as well, then what it's, what's, what the question come to my mind, it means, what is the point actually to use the concept which has been developed for the pre-modern society and uh, adopted as an analytical tool for the mass society in 21st century. It means you criticize, again, mildly, but there was mention, uh, Dirkheim. That the Dirkheim killed the concept of despotism. That's something which is present in the book. It's, uh, it's, I don't know, I like Dirkheim. And it seems to me that, that when you stress this voluntary, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, servitude of citizens, then it's impossible actually to escape from some sort of the concept of the social <clears throat> structure, which means it's necessary to have a, some, some at least elements of the social theory, social means social groups, and uh, in order to, 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 to maybe, you know, to further develop the concept of the new despotism. But the most radical uh, maybe suggestions which I've got, why not to choose a new concept, not coin the new one, not, not follow the despotism as such, but basically develop something which will be precisely your own only, it means which will suit or fit precisely to the, cons to the issue of the issues uh, of relation between the citizens and power in the 21st century. And the second point, brief one, it means, is a lack of the cultural dimension. It means you put to the same bag plenty of different societies, let's say, and I think that there is a huge difference between, let's say, society in Kyrgyzia, and it's still the tribal society, and um, Hungary, for instance, which is much more individualistic society. So the cultural dimension in the analysis is uh, not very convincing, it seems to me, and possibly should be taken into account. And then as a lawyer, <laughs> nobody's perfect, right? It means then uh, I institutional analysis. It means Martin is the pope of the rule of law. But in this short chapter, when you mention rule of law here, there is a very, it seems to me, uh, the analysis of the 
of the use of law, which, which you claim rightly that is a rule by law, but not rule of law as such. But let's think about it. it means you, you stress that some element of legality should exist in this new despotism. If we accept such presumption that some element of legality, not to everybody, but to the majority, let's say, of the population, then the institution, in order to work properly, it means properly, to, re to, re to receive some prestige, should possess some semi-autonomy. It means, I don't say the out total autonomy, but the legality, dura lex et lex, but presuppose some some minimum autonomy of the legal institutions. So which, which immediately it is maybe is a starting point for this strategic way of thinking about the accountability, because I totally agree with you that the uh, accountability of, uh, of a ruling elite is a crucial, crucial point. So it seems to me that this element of the of, uh, semi-autonomous institutions operating within the new despotism that element should be elaborated. And, uh, and uh, questions now, it means questions which were put, okay, two minutes I'll finish. Oh. Yeah. The first question, relation between the new despotism and populism. It means populism is mentioned a few times, but without any elaboration. What came to my mind when I read this part was that maybe populism is precisely the outcome of the operation of new despotism. What I mean by that, it means you stress even today in, the, in your introduction that there is a selective application of violence, eliminations of the some people who are the most dangerous for the regime. Therefore, there, is not, there, is, there are no, in, no leaders, no leadership. The example is Belarus nowadays, for instance. But, but, but what is, what is possible, what, is, what we could see is that, that a populism as a sort of a movement which is directed towards a correction from time to time of the new despotism. And uh, this bring to my mind this idea of the late Polish, uh, lawyer, philosopher, Leszek Nowa. It means Leszek Nowa during solidarity period, he developed this idea of the failed revolutions. It means what he claimed that the most successful actually from the point of view of democratization are the not winning revolutions because after each revolution there was a bigger despotism to say, but the failed revolution when the rights of citizens and accountability of the ruling elites increased because precisely of the failed revolution. So I combine that with a populist movement that maybe the contemporary new populist movement, they play a similar role. It means to bring, to introduce some correction in the operation of the new despotism. Adam. And then, Adam. Yes. Finish? Finish. Okay. Maybe in the uh, So the I minute. don't have a time. All right, so. Uh, I finish with this, with the, on, on this point. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to do that. It's just that we have, I understand, in the software, a limited time for the whole thing, and then it all uh, stops. Uh, I want to make three points. Last year, uh, there were a number of books appeared about how democracies die, perish, end, and one of the authors of those books, David Runciman, said we make a mistake by doing typically what many people do and what I've been wont to do, to translating that question into another one. If democracies are to end, does that mean that, or is the, is the test what we saw in the 20s and 30s? That is the rise of something the opposite as we saw it as democracies, dictatorships, ideologically driven, communist, fascist, driven not only ideologically, but heavy on killing, heavy on violence, heavy on the subordination and uh, suborning of any forms of independence, of institutions, of individuals, of associations, of media, of information. And he said, 
our political imaginations, this is Ransom, and are stuck with our dated images of what democratic failure is. We're trapped in the landscape of the 20th century. Now, if you want to be that trap to be sprung, there is no better source, no better book to read than the New Despotism, because it's exactly there that John insists the dangers to democracy, first of all, are not the opposite of democracy. They don't come from outer space. They come, many of them come from pathologies developed within democracy. But more than that, and this is my first point, it's common for us to see uh, the dangers, pathologies of democracy in things which are the opposite of us. Whereas what, and in particular within institution destruction, not transformation, not shape-shifting as he calls it, but destruction. And he points out that the institutions, law even, uh, the press, elections, are not destroyed, they are transmuted in complex, often technologically sophisticated, sophisticated way to serve ends very hostile to those with which they were or in the interests of which they were spawned. He has a very nice phrase, lovely phrase. These are not destructions of elections, of democracy, of, of law, of media, they rather develop transmutations into phantom forms of the same, phantom rule of law, phantom democracy, phantom elections. He puts it this way about the rule of law, which is my own obsession. The rule of law has phantom qualities in this regime. It's at the same time real and elusive. There, but not there. Present, but absent. Law means the observance, but also the abuse and non-use of law. And he insists that these phantoms are not fairy tales. They're not pure facades. The complexity of the new dispositism is precisely in that. They're marked by the trimmings and trappings of well-governed qualities. The most switched on despots are master copyists of democratic style. They're hard governments in velvet form. Now, my first point of praise is that it's so common for us to see institutions as the incarnations of our values. If we want democracy, we look for elections. If we want the rule of law, we want to see that law is, is observed. Now, very often in these regimes, you have elections, and in Hungary, for example, they're free, they're fair, and the, the, the governments win. Uh, if in law, the government has a super majority, can do what it likes legally, but they're in phenomenal, in fundamental ways, fraudulent, but not destroyed. And this complexity is something which is at the heart, these ambiguities, these transformations, these mutations, is at the heart of, I think, the originality and the perceptiveness of this book. And, uh, and I commend the book for that. Uh, now, John, hard to go from page two to six, but I've managed to do it. Uh, these, these rulers, these despots, uh, are a serious alternative to power sharing democracy, says John, because in all of this transmutation, and all of this, it's not that violence disappears. It's not that it's not there. It hangs over there. It can be used, but it's not the staple, the central aspect of this. Uh, but the, the core, the key of, of this new form is that rather than bully, uh, they deflect. Instead of denying, they co-opt. They, they co-opt, sorry. Ra they buy rather than bully. They deflect instead of deny. They co-opt rather than confront. Their citizens are beguiled by sweet talk by rulers of the people. Now, my second point, which is a critical point, takes this as 
an inadequate analysis or an analysis of the appeal of these regimes or some of these regimes, which doesn't capture others. It was a number of people, and I, when I first saw the manuscript, worried that, as Adam has pointed out, too much seemed to be squeezed into this category. What has China got to do with Tajikistan? What has uh, Singapore got to do with Belarusia? And John fairly and appropriately says, look, I'm not trying to capture every detail of every species. I'm trying to focus on common features of the genus. And my initial criticism, which I wrote to John when I saw the manuscript, was of that sort. Are you trying to see too much in and now I'm satisfied that he has captured that? Now on rereading, I worry that a certain aspect or a certain kind of new despotism is not adequately addressed, and that is populist regimes. Mm -hmm. Many of these regimes are not populist, but some of the most astounding, striking, and new despotisms and despotisms in wait waiting are populist, and they're not at, their, at the core of their, of their rhetoric, of their appeal, is not yet, at least, is not yet an appeal to the soft, supine, lazy, accommodating, apolitical population that they that they bribe and they they don't bully, but they they uh, entice into voluntary servitude. There is something in modern new populist regimes of not only something central aspect of fear of anger, of resentment, of fear of displacement, resentment of displacement. If you think of the rhetoric, but not only the rhetoric, many of the practices of Orban, Kaczynski, Modi, Bolsonaro, Erdogan, Duterte, Trump, these are not soft, smart, you know, say technocratic welfare state givers. They are people who at least also, but maybe primarily, play off these angers fears and resentments. And while John talks, use, it doesn't use the language, he mentions the word populism, this fury, this anger, which is quasi ideological even, doesn't seem to me fit the, the softer, gentler image of, and, and reality of some of the other despotisms. The Polish Minister of Culture four days ago was interviewed and after the win by his side of the most recent presidential elections, he said, uh, we're involved in a culture war over our identity, over our Polish soul. It's actually taking place right now. And though it won't be easy, it's there to be won. We won't give in. We want and will fight in defense of our Christian identity because it's a source of Polishness. We're not afraid, and so on. Now, that is not simply a Polish characteristic. It's characteristic of many of the new populist regimes. And it seems to me that is something that we need to keep in mind, particularly in, in regard to the third and last point I want to make. Because, of course, there's the future. And it's really, this is a question, not a criticism. John is aware with the Yogi Berra that it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And he doesn't try. He says that these futures are open and these are some of the ingredients. But there are two stories or two tones in the book. On the one hand, we learn that the new despotisms are more flexible, more subtle, more efficient. They are most of, most probably more durable than their predecessors or their, their, uh, their antagonists. The powers of survival are formidable. And there's a lot of this description of the powers of resilience and, and intelligence and gathering of information and using of information. On the other hand, we hear that the general rule, but we hear far less of this, is that despotic regimes appear legitimate and stable until they collapse or are overthrown. Despotic power functions as an aphrodisiac. Despots are hooked on the stuff and stuff it off. Sooner or later, they usually become easy meat for the vultures or hoodwits. Now, there's no contradiction here. After all, even Achilles, who John mentioned, had his heel, and after all, too, he walked on his heel, so it must have hurt him. But there is a tension, or perhaps irresolution, I think, between the two things. How do we know that the new despots are so durable since they're so new? 
One of the oldest of them, Lukashenko, might be on the way out, and sometimes they don't even seem to be very smart. And particularly if you think of the populists. The pandemic illustrates this. My first fear was that they would simply use it to expand their power, and then you sort of to do that. But some of the worst performers, some of the most humiliated performers, have been the newest, most populous despots and want be despots. They include Belarus, several of the stands, Iran, Turkey, Brazil, Venezuela, and so on. And this has a lot to do with exactly the capricious and uninformed nature of the despotic power they wield, their refusals to recognize crises that they don't create or control, and their hostility to difficult information. I have no answers to this question, um, but uh, it's enough to, for me to pose them, and now I seek from the prophet to get the answers. And so back to John. Well, uh, uh, th thank you, thank you so much uh, to the um, uh, to the three WAM um, commentators. Uh, I, I'll be very brief because I'm. We we have um, many many participants. I know um, that some have uh, risen very early in the morning. For some, it's very late at night. Um, so certainly they, sh they should, sh should speak. I think these comments um, are all very rich. Uh, all, uh, I have taken notes, I learn from them, and I have a few things to say in reply. Um, to Adam, but also to Martin, and I think uh, Wojciech as well, yes, uh, this book emphasizes the genus and not the species. I'm interested in what uh, these different regimes have in common. I don't suppose that all dogs are Dalmatians. I don't suppose that the earth is flat. Um, I want to get at, before generating subtypes, I want to get at um, these characteristics in common, which I've, which I've summarized and which the book deals with at length. I would say that um, so far not mentioned on this point um, that I want to emphasize the importance of China. And some of you will know that I have written on China. I'm intending to write more on China because it does seem to me it is the leader of the pack. It's the very clear alternative. And actually all that um, to power sharing uh, democracy and that the emphasis on the resilience, on the learning capacity, on the whip smartness, I think certainly applies to uh, this regime. You can see um, that double dynamic of hubris, of blindness, and the capacity to spring into action, to learn, to regulate, to control. You can see that double dynamic uh, in the pestilence of um, the first half of this year. It begins in Wuhan. Uh, there is every attempt to, uh, to block, censor what the medics are saying. Uh, there are local reasons for that in Hubei province. Um, uh, two party uh, major meetings in January. Nothing is done. Uh, then the gates come crashing down. There's total lockdown. And um, it's uh, now uh, a dynamic in which uh, much of China is up on its feet while uh, many parts of the world uh, are now down on our knees. Um, life is returning to normality. This is one illustration of uh, this general point, but I want to say um, here that the, the case of China is critically important for the book. Second thing to say is, uh, and I, I, sh I, I, perhaps I can just mention these points rather than argue them at length. Um, a passing remark about David Runciman uh, and his book about how democracies die and the, um, the, the misleading analogies with the 1920s and 30s. My problem with his work is that uh, when you read it, you'll see that he resurrects um, organic metaphors. Democracies are suffering a midlife crisis. All democracies die. Uh, but but uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a kind of 1920s uh, simile um, the, the, the attempt to apply the, the bodily organic metaphor, which I think is, is uh, very unsatisfactory. Um, to um, to um, Wojciech's uh, point about 
the conceptual imperialism of the book. I love this. Uh, if you called it Bolshevik, it would have been, you know, much more painful. I mean, I, yes, um, the book makes a case for resurrecting and reconstructing, bringing to life uh, an old category that was last used uh, in the 1950s. And it is the case that I might have um, uh, adopted more sympathetically what the quantum people, Niels Bohr, called the complementarity principle. You know, that this, this is an additional concept that, that brings um, to the table problematics like the problem of voluntary servitude. You know, how is it that top-down power manages to win the loyalty of its subjects who don't feel um, uh, uh, totally uh, terrified and, uh, and repressed? Um, and one case in point of perhaps the need for more ecumenicism, of more, um, let's say, um, a, a more Catholic view would be the concept of autocracy. It rightly gets at um, some of the Alice in Wonderland features of, uh, uh, of these regimes. You know, when Erdogan says that he can do no wrong and that Turkey uh, will survive and thrive because God has willed it, this is a moment of, uh, of uh, autocratic uh, hubris. Or when you may know uh, Kim Jong-un travels outside of North Korea, his feces and his urine are bagged uh, because of paranoia about, um, about his opponents and uh, inside and outside the regime. Uh, the book describes Nyatsov in, um, in Turkmenistan. Lukashenko would be an example of uh, the way the category of autocracy gets at this kind of um, uh, hubris at the top. Uh, when Lukashenko, you know, has repeatedly in recent months denounced the psychosis of those who go on and on about the pestilence and says, you know, that the, the best cure uh, is, of course, to drink more vodka and go uh, for a sauna. You know, th there are these Alice in Wonderland, you know, shouting sheep and, and talking flower moments that the concept of autocracy gets at. So I, I understand and I hear this uh, plea for ecumenicism. I think um, I, I've got uh, 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 quickly a couple of other things, if I may, uh, Martin, uh, to say. I, I think that um, several of you, Wojciech, Wojciech and also uh, Adam, said that um, I rather neglected the demand side, in contrast to the supply side, that I've been rather negligent of the social dimensions of um, the way these regimes operate. Actually, I think this is not the case. I think that the category of voluntary servitude, which I take as a marker of, of these uh, regimes, um, gets at the ways in which people in all of their diversity, down below, so to say, in these regimes, are won over not because they are useful idiots or because they are brainwashed, uh, but because um, they are willing to participate in the appeals, in the institutional dynamics of uh, these polities. Elections are a very good example. I also describe the way in which at the everyday life level, um, there are kind of functional, uh, functional advantages of certain behavior, like belly aching. Belly aching is chronic through these despotisms, but despots love belly aches. They complain, but they do nothing. Or um, the way that jokes are, are allowed in everyday life uh, settings. The book has quite a number of them. I mean, these are revenges against despotic power. You know, um, there is um, the, the joke about the dying despot uh, whose chief advisor comes to him and says, um, uh, your highness, um, the people want to see you one last time. And the despot replies, why, where are they going? Uh, you know, this is the kind of joke that gets, um, that is, so to say, a revenge. And central to this book in the media section is the way that um, these despotisms harness the unfinished communications revolution of our time. Uh, digital network media, 
they do not act as systems of total control and censorship. They actually allow, as in Iran, as in Russia, as in China, a certain measure of resistance and of digital mutinies. They serve the functions of early warning detector systems. They allow steam to be blown off. So these are illustrations, I think, of the importance of, uh, uh, of, of, of the social. About populism, I um, declare myself guilty. Uh, I have written about that subject elsewhere. I think, um, to repeat, one of the weaknesses of this book is that um, it should be a next one. How do you build a despotism? Well, um, we are uh, seeing, I think, as in the case of Bolsonaro and, and Orban, uh, Kaczynski, uh, Modi, uh, number 45, Duterte, and so on. We are seeing a certain dynamic of this new populism that it seems to me pushes, I think Wojciech makes this very clear in his book on Poland, uh, pushes towards the, the construction of despotic power. And yes, it's not soft and gentle and resilient. It's, it's, it's bullish, it plays, it, it does friend enemy uh, uh, politics and so on. Well, um, none of that is described uh, very well in the book. There is no account of how to build uh, a despotism. Um, I would say that here, um, subsequently, uh, um, after the publication of this book, I looked at um, two texts uh, published in 1919. One, Max Weber's uh, Politik als Beruf, Politics as Vocation, where with the coming of um, mass democracy, he predicts that plebiscitarian leader democracy will be a chronic feature of power sharing constitutional democracies. Führer Demokratie. In the same year, a Venezuelan, Vianya Lanz, published a book um, whose, trans whose title translated is Democratic Caesarism. What he, a Hobbesian, uh, says is that in the age of mass democracy, what is likely to happen and what should happen is that state-managed populism um, uh, should, should prevail, that this is the best way of ensuring um, order, but also winning the loyalty of, uh, of the subject uh, population. All of these despotisms, I think, are species in a strange uh, way of this via uh, state-managed uh, populism. Um, I think um, I'd better stop, but I have to uh, say a few words about the category of authoritarianism and why I feel discomfort about it, uh, uh, Wojciech. Why reject it? Well, um, there is no time to discuss its genealogy. It sounds like a very old uh, term. Actually, uh, there is, uh, it's not clear whether it's Sam Huntington or whether it's Juan Lintz. Uh, circa 1970, who first uh, uses this uh, neologism. And when you look back at that, as I have done um, as carefully as I can, you see that it, it's a category that comes in the form of a dualism. There is authoritarianism and there is liberal democracy. It has an American accent. And the distinction is that in authoritarian regimes, there are no elections and in uh, liberal democratic uh, uh, regimes, there are elections. Descriptively, that's, um, that doesn't work. Almost all of these despotisms practice elections and I describe in the book uh, the functional advantages of them. Not only that, but that very dualism between authoritarianism and democracy supposes there's no democracy in these authoritarian regimes. And um, each of uh, you have rightly pointed out that there, is, uh, there are phantom democratic qualities of these policies. So descriptively, I have an objection. I also don't like, um, this was missing uh, Wojtek uh, from your remarks, I don't like the damage that is done to a very precious word um, in legal and political uh, uh, vocabularies that of authority, autoritas. You know, um, it's almost a universal, I have had discussions with Chinese colleagues about this, that the distinction between power and authority is, is, is chronic in many global settings. 
the point in plain English is that those who exercise power are not entitled to authorize their own power. That the authorization of power, that the authority of power comes from some external source, whatever that source may be. It may be tradition, it may be God, uh, it may be um, uh, um, uh, nature, uh, or it may be monetary uh, institutions that confer authority on those who uh, rule. The, the problem with the category is that it destroys that distinction. Uh, it blindly uh, steamrolls over it. And then finally, I think that the category of authoritarianism, um, certainly from the beginning, uh, Juan Lintz and, uh, and Sam Huntington, is um, very directly linked, normatively speaking, to the ideal of American style liberal democracy. Now, um, things are not going very well in the United States. Uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, destroy the ideals of liberal democracy, but it does seem to me that the great, so if you use the concept of authoritarianism, normatively the counterfactual of liberal democracy is present. And my problem with that uh, is that for a Buddhist or, um, uh, a believer of Islam, or a Christian Democrat in the European scene, for instance, um, is asked to buy in to the normative supposed universalism of liberal democracy. I think that the great advantage of the category of despotism, if you look at its genealogy and particularly what happens to it in the second half of the 18th century, it's much more ecumenical. Aristocrats had um, a strong hand in fashioning that concept, Montesquieu. It was used by Republicans, liberals later, um, uh, uh, Democrats certainly. It was part of the poetry of the American and the French revolutions, that word despotism. So what, what I try to say in the book is that um, uh, a key reason for reviving it and, and, and deploying it is that the counterfactual is uh, that uh, power, which is, uh, which attempts to be self-authorizing, power which uh, is arbitrary, power which is unchecked, is dangerous power. It can produce great evils, as we know. Uh, and so uh, um, Adam, one final sentence, uh, lurking behind this category of despotism, lurking uh, its way, so to say, through the book is um, the principle of monetary democracy. I mean, I wrote about it in many other contexts. I thought this was not the case to go on and on um, about that concept, but I can see why it causes you um, and others some confusion some sense that I'm hiding something uh, from, from the reader. I didn't mean to do that, but here to make the point um, uh, firm and to conclude, uh, the normative advantage of the category of despotism is that it uh, flags up the problem of arbitrary, um, reckless uh, exercises of power power that breaks rules, breaks its own rules, power that avoids the facts, uh, power that um, uh, rests upon illogicality, power that is unconstrained uh, by flanking institutions. And that seems to me to be of universal importance, whether it is China, uh, whether it is Saudi, um, or what uh, ever context you want to mention. And here, finally, finally, I, I, I would um, draw your attention to the very final um, column piece written by um, Khashoggi in the Washington Post. It was uh, written in Arabic and uh, published in the Washington Post, where what's interesting is that he doesn't um, condemn the Saudi and other Arab despotisms 
uh, by mobilizing or invoking the principles of liberal democracy. It's more ecumenical, that essay, in which he says that the basic problem is the abuse of power of states who in the name of the people and using all of these techniques that I describe, um, screw their subjects and um, produce hubris and foolish decisions and also bring uh, 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 ills, misfortunes and evils to uh, that part of the world. I agree with that very much and it's very much the, the normative spirit that runs through this category of a despotism. But thank you so much. Well, amen to that. And we said at the beginning, but one does, uh, when discussing a book, say that it's a rich book, but I think you've learned from the discussion that it's an extremely rich, varied, uh, morally informed, empirically wonderfully informed, and analytically rigorous book. And, and I'm grateful for our chance to talk about it, as will the audience be at last for their chance to ask questions about it. And I hand over to uh, Carolyn, who has this will in hand. I understand. Uh, you understand correctly, but we are uh, having opened for questions. We await some questions. Tunis has provided a comment there that you can read. That oh, and uh, Mikhail Stambulski uh, is providing the question also. John, if we can consider that the described regimes have popular support and are based on some kind of social contract, economically effective and so on. On what normative basis can we say that these regimes are, air quotes, bad? Um, don't um, the people have the democratic right to choose their despotism? What could be the ethical argumentation against supporting such regimes? And part two from Michal is that he asks, what does it mean that power is arbitrary? Well, um, that's a longer conversation and you don't feel obliged to answer that one now. But he goes on to ask, is it possible not to have arbitrary power outside the framework of liberal democracy? And again, a longer question there. Uh, John, would you like to take a run at that question while I look at the others? Um, yeah, yeah, briefly, thank you very much for these. Um, yeah, there is, on, on the question of a social contract, um, in the book at several points, uh, I invoke that phrase to describe um, the way, for example, during elections, uh, where the majesty of the rulers, um, so to say, comes to the streets and calls upon the people to sanction their majesty. Um, the presumption at work in these elections, which can go wrong, as in Iran in 2009, as in Belarus uh, during the past uh, uh, week, um, the logic at work is that there is indeed a contract. Um, we rule, you obey. We rule, but we deliver. Uh, we rule you don't, we bring advantages to your lives, we raise your level of dignity, we promote um, uh, economic growth, for example, uh, we reduce violence, we, um, in, in general, uh, grant you dignity of a kind that you previously didn't have. And that contract, of course, has a phantom quality to it. How would it be tested? Well, it would be tested if there was open, uh, institutionalized openness uh, 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 in the interrogation of power. But its absence is very striking. So it's an implicit uh, contract that is difficult to test. A as for the, the democratic right to choose despotism, Oh, it's a long discussion. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the, the flippant reply would be to say it's an, ox, it's, a, it's an oxymoronic proposition, you know, that the people who are sovereign give, give away their sovereignty uh, to a few who then rule them uh, and rule them forever. Um, 
But it's more complicated, and the question is a very pertinent one because I have for many years been interested in the critique of democracy understood as self-government of the people, for example, through their chosen representatives. I've been interested in the way that democracy um, uh, has from the very beginning been plagued by the pathology of what has come to be called populism, um, demagogy, uh, its proneness to mutate um, into something despotic. So um, th that relationship between despotism and democracy, which is very central to the book, is not an accidental one. There is, so to say, an elective affinity between them. Um, and um, the aim of this book and other works that I've done is to um, is is to to adopt a precautionary view to alert um, those uh, who are Democrats to the dangers exactly of this uh, trend um, on arbitrary power. Uh, I'm not sure if. Um, a uh, good friend and colleague of mine uh, managed to get up early this morning um, in uh, Eastern Canada. But it's uh, thanks to him that, um, and to Martin that I have been thinking for some years now about what counts as, as arbitrary power. And I understand uh, from my friend that, for example, in um, Canadian courts, um, the uh, phrase arbitrary and capricious power refers to power which, for example, in judicial review of governmental decisions, it refers to power exercised by a government where it breaks its own rules. This is a first criterion where it does it, where decisions are taken that are out of sync with the facts that it claims are at work. And it's the exercise of power through reasoning that's bogus. You know, there are non sequiturs, there's, there are illogicalities. I think um, that is, um, for me, um, uh, a feature of all of these despotisms. You know, the rulers break their own rules. Um, they, don't, they pay insufficient attention to the facts of situations. Uh, and, um, and they rule through a kind of vaudeville logic. But I would also say in a more expansive understanding of um, the concept of arbitrary power, that Power is arbitrary when it is unchecked by, unrestrained by, independent, monitory accountability bodies, of which courts are, of course, central, of which uh, media platforms are, are central, so are free and fair elections, so are civil society organizations that check and balance and blow whistles uh, on uh, those who exercise power. These despotisms suffer shortages of all of those mechanisms. And in that sense, I think they are systems of arbitrary power writ large, and it's their great weakness. And would the panelists like to add to that? Sorry, Martin, you're muted. Martin is muted. Yes, rare, rare event. No, I just endorse that, that uh, so often we reduce values to whatever local parochial institutions have been developed with them in mind. And one of the dangers of that is that we identify the values with these particular institutions, and particularly if we're powerful countries uh, on a mission, it's the ex institutions that we seek to export. And very often those institutions fail, and we think that that means that the values are up for grabs, or at least, or maybe worthless. Mm -hmm. Whereas the problem is the values haven't been approached. And one of the, one of the uh, virtues, I think, of this book is the disconnection between these values which John suggests like hostility to arbitrary power have a universal dimension and the particular ways that 
we've sought to develop them in particular places, which may work there or not, but may equally not be transportable. That doesn't mean value like hostility to arbitrariness is, is a knockout. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to the latter part of Michal's uh, question, uh, where he asks, is it possible to have not arbitrary power outside the framework of liberal democracy? And in one sense, the answer is obviously yes, but I think the struggle is to find out where and how and who might do that and how we'd know whether we have it when we do. Um, yeah. we, we do have one or two other questions, but we are very close to time. Um, and I would just warn participants that the, uh, if we run over, we may be uh, exited from the discussion. So we have a, a very general question from uh, Cathy Sherry, who asks, I beg your pardon. We have one quick question, then Cathy's. Um, the book does not mention how to build despotism. The question seems to be, what makes despotism possible? What are the economic, social and cultural factors that might let a particular society become prone or continue as prone to despotism? Um, intuitions or comments or uh, thoughts in that regard? Um, in fact, why don't you comment on that while I just try and uh, scan this last question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> um, um, most of you will not know that I have just um, finished with an Indian colleague, a new book on India. And it is um, effectively um, a book about um, how a dysfunctional democracy, electoral democracy, that neglects its social foundations and that um, uh, witnesses the appearance of a political party that in the name of the people begins to win elections and led by a demagogue begins to tamper with the flanking institutions of electoral democracy. That is happening and it is well advanced in the Indian case said by the Americans to be the world's largest democracy. Um, what we, my colleague and I, um, uh, say in this book, uh, it's what the book is about, is that um, here is a case uh, of, uh, with all due respects to the difference, here is a case of Hungary um, in the subcontinent. You know, it, it, the, 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 the transition to what may turn out to be despotic rule led by the BJP and Modi is something that it took Orban, uh, Fidesz, not much more than a decade to pull off. Mm. Uh, and so um, how you build democracy, uh, how you build despotisms, uh, one needs to look at these case studies, but my very short answer is that all of the elements that I discuss in this book have to be, so to say, brought together that the recombination of these elements mm -hmm. is, 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 is what the, the transition requires. When you have all of those elements, when you have a state capitalism that also dispenses welfare, when you have elections that are won um, through manipulation, when you, when you hide away violence, et cetera, then um, uh, in every context, that polity, which used to be called democracy, uh, is vulnerable to uh, the curse of despotism, I would say. Well, thanks to Wojciech Zemerski for that very uh, thought-provoking question. Um, Melinda Rankin would like to hear, uh, says it's wonderful to hear about your book, and I would join Melinda in, uh, in making that comment. The quick question she had is, thinking about despotism governing along some sort of spectrum, uh, China may generally be represented as despotic rule in, a, in the way that you've described at some length, but its tyrannical impulses, such as the alleged situation against the Uyghurs using force, 
may take it somewhere else on that spectrum or perhaps on another axis entirely. Any thoughts? Um, what is, thank you very much, Belinda, and hello. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, thank you very much for the question. I, I mean, if it, it's, there is another book to be written about the dysfunctions of despotism and how to dismantle despotic power. And part of the story uh, would be, analytically speaking, that these despotisms um, do breed resistance from below and face with threats to the whole political order are prone to use violence. They try to camouflage it as um, the Chinese Communist Party has tried to do in the province of Xinjiang, where I have um, visited twice. Uh, and for local reasons, um, whistles were blown and stories escaped the controls. And of course, uh, the Chinese regime uh, is now confronted with uh, a global critique of um, what it has done or is trying to pull off uh, in some kind of imperial fashion, a colonization uh, with great violence and the extinction of uh, Islam and other customs associated uh, with that region. Um, this is the tyrannical impulse that you uh, speak of. Uh, I think, sociologically speaking, my understanding um, from many visits to China, many um, contacts with many Chinese intellectuals and friends, is that the bulk of the population, the Chinese Han Chinese middle classes, um, are not prepared to get exercised about that violence. And that needs to be borne in mind. They say that um, this is, of course, language that's coming from the decadent West. Uh, and it's, you know, embodied in number 45, who now goes on and on about the China virus. You know, they're picking on us. And they reply that this is not only the resurgence of Orientalism. I'm just describing, I'm not defending it, but I'm describing um, what commonly is said. And um, WeChat is full of these kinds of views. And they say, look, why would we ever want um, to be a dysfunctional polity of the American kind? I mean, this, this has a measure of plausibility about it. And besides, um, we remain loyal and we are rather proud of what has happened um, inside our country. We've lifted hundreds of millions of people from poverty. We have um, begun the process of universalizing tertiary education. We are putting in place a pension system and some kind of universal healthcare system. We have regained our dignity after terrible, um, a terrible civil war, terrible violence during uh, Mao, et cetera, et cetera. And for that reason, there is, um, a kind of moral nonchalance about that violence uh, which is camouflaged um, and about which there is great silence inside much of the Chinese polity. Uh, I think it has to be understood. That silence has to be understood. And it is, of course, a force, um, a force uh, for resilience of the regime. Well, we do have a few more questions that we simply won't be able to get to. So I will uh, pump the football back to Martin for the close of our session. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to all of the panelists, most of all to John, second most of all, not second really, Carolyn, and way down the end with the great things. We'll check in. Adam, uh, one thing before we end. Uh, one of the despotisms John discusses is that of Alexander Lukashenko in, in Belarus, who staged and claimed to win a rigged election on 9th of August, and ever since then, peaceful protests of hundreds of thousands of people have come out of the streets. Uh, the future is completely 
undecipherable at the moment. There's been brutal um, putting down of many demonstrators, jailing, tortures have been reported. Uh, and it's a fact of moral significance enormously, and, and of course for every citizen of Belarusia, it will also have, likely to have, geopolitical consequences. And I don't bring it in simply out of some moral, uh, general moral impulse, but it is directly related to our theme. And uh, the three of us, Wojciech Adam and, and I, thought that it would be appropriate that we mention that anybody who would like to donate uh, to support the Russian people in this critical time should know where to do so. And on our uh, the website of, of our blog, that is uh, globalconpop.blog, at the end of this uh, web webinar, there will be a, a website which accepts donations. It doesn't just accept them, but puts them to good use. We have that very strong authority. Uh, with that, I'm sorry that uh, the enthusiasm of our audience was not able to be satisfied in the sense that we could go on a great deal longer. Uh, the book is, is, as we've said, fascinating, the discussion and John's uh, exposition and defense of his views has been exemplary and I'm glad that we were able to do it and I'm glad that you were able to hear him and us and we will plan, plan is actually too strong a word, we hope that we will have more webinars and I certainly hope that they approach this one in quality. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Adam and Martin and everyone who joined us.